All right, welcome again to episode 12 of our podcast. Today we'll try to cover as many questions as we can. Okay, let's start with our first question. Okay, for our first question, despite the fact that the burden of proving that the dismissal was for just causes enumerated under Article 297 and 298 of the Labor Code, the employee also has the burden of proof to uh, burden of proof to prove what to the court. No? Uh, again, despite the fact that the burden of proving that the dismissal was for just cause enumerated under Article 297 and 298 of the Labor Code, the employee also has the burden of proof to prove what to the court. To the court, no. This is for the case of the employee. Okay, so he has to prove that he was actually dismissed. Or was it just because he was the one who doesn't want to report? No, because uh, as we all know, the court is not unmindful of the rule that in cases of illegal dismissal, the employers, uh, the employee bears the burden of proof to prove that the termination was valid uh, or authorized cause. No, for authorized cause, uh, the burden of proof shifts. No, depending on what particular aspect of the employment has to be proved, proven. Now, in this case, the employer bears the burden of proving uh, that the termination was valid. But before uh, that, the employee should bear the burden of proving that the dismissal was legal. Uh, uh, before the employer could do that, he must first establish you know, by substantial evidence that indeed they were dismissed. Uh, if there is no dismissal, then there can be no question as to the legality or the illegality uh, thereof. So there was no dismissal, particular in a particular case, uh, if the person is not an employee of that particular employer. Okay, so that is for labor law. Okay, let's proceed now to the next. All right. For the next question, Fernando filed an administrative complaint against his co-teacher Amelia, claiming that the latter is living with a married man who is not her husband. Fernando charged Amelia with committing disgraceful immoral violation, uh, particularly a conduct, no, uh, which is a violation of the revised administrative code and thus should not be allowed to remain employed in the government. By the way, our story is uh, this case is all about uh, this case is all about a a member of the court no? so uh, in this case Amelia on the other hand claims that she and her partner are members of a re religious sect that allows members of the congregation who have been abandoned by their respective spouses to enter into marital relations under declaration of pleading faithfulness uh, this is usually for Jehovah's Witnesses. Having made such declaration, she argues that she cannot be charged with committing immoral conduct for she is entitled to free exercise of religion no, under the Constitution. The question now is, Amelia administratively liable? State your reasons briefly. Briefly explain, uh, also explain the concept, the concept, uh, the concept of benevolent neutrality. All right. What do you think is the answer? Okay, in this case, actually, Amelia is not administratively liable. There is no compelling state interest that justifies inhibiting the free exercise of religious beliefs. This means, uh, the means used by the government to achieve its legitimate objective is not the least intrusive means. No, please, uh, you can read this uh, decision in the case of Estrada versus Escritor. Okay? And uh, for B, explain benevolent neutrality. It means that with respect to governmental actions, no, as long as it's an action of the government, no, uh, accommodation of religion may be permitted to allow individuals and groups to exercise their religion without hindrance. Bawal mo pigilan. Kasi Valentine's Day ngayon. <laughs> what is sought is not a declaration of unconstitutionality of the law, but an exception from its application. Again, you just read the case of Estrada versus Escritor. Okay, proceed.
Okay. In the case of Rika, no, Rika petitioned for annulment of her 10-year-old marriage to Richard. Richard hired attorney Cruz to represent him in the proceedings. In payment of attorney Cruz's acceptance and legal fees, Richard conveyed to attorney Cruz a parcel of land in Taguig that he recently purchased with his lotto winnings. Wow, suerte. Okay. The transfer documents were duly signed by Attorney Cruz. No, sure, you got Attorney. <laughs> uh, immediately took possession by fencing off the property's entire perimeter. Attorney Cruz immediately took possession again by uh, fencing it and desperately needing money to pay for his mounting legal fees and his other needs. And despite the transfer to Attorney Cruz, Richard offered the same parcel of land for sale to spouses Garcia. So he sold it again. My God. Now, after inspection of the land, the spouses considered it as a good investment. Patay na. Okay, and so, uh, because they see it as a good investment, purchase it from Richard. Immediately after the sale, the spouses Garcia commenced the construction of a three-story building over the land. But they were prevented from doing this, no? Kinsaman, by Attorney Cruz. Remember, it was first sold to Attorney Cruz who claimed that he has a better right in the light of prior conveyance in his favor. So, what do you think? Is Attorney Cruz's claim correct? Okay. Okay. So, the answer is no. No? Uh, no. <laughs> Why? Because Attorney Cruz is actually not correct. No, At first glance, it may appear that Attorney Cruz is the one who has the better right. Because he took possession of the property. However, a lawyer is prohibited under Article 149. No, you check Article 1491. The Civil Code, this is actually a provision from the Civil Code, from acquiring property and rights which may be subject for any litigation in which they may take part by virtue of their prof profession. Well, the suit is an annulment of marriage. It may be argued that the land itself is not the object of litigation. The annulment of marriage, if granted, will carry, remember, it will carry the liquidation of the absolute, absolute, <laughs> the absolute community or conjugal partnership of the spouses as the case may be. So, Article 50 in relation to Article 43 of the Family Code, Richard actually purchased the land with his lotto winnings during the pendency of the suit for annulment and on the assumption that the parties are governed by the regime uh, of absolute community or conjugal partnership. So it's still governed by that, even if it's a lotto winning. For uh, winnings from gambling or betting will form part thereof. Also, since the land is part of the absolute community or conjugal partnership with Richard and Rika, a mate, it may not be sold or alienated without the consent of the latter. And any disposition or encumbrance, uh, in this case of the property of the community or conjugal property without the consent of the other spouse, is tang -da -da -dang, void no it's void no you look at article 96 and article 124 of the family code okay next question in what instances were in uh, the complaint could be considered sufficient basis for the outright dismissal of the complaint Again, in what instances were in the complaint could be considered sufficient basis for the outright dismissal of the complaint? Okay, there are five cases here no, to, to be noted. First is, when, uh, first is when the offense is committed outside the territorial jurisdiction of the office. Automatic. Uh, close. <laughs> Dismiss. When at the time of the complaint, the offense, uh, the offense charge had already prescribed. Okay. Close. Dismiss. The complainant is not authorized under the provision of the pertinent laws to file a complaint. You're not qualified. No, you're not authorized. Okay, close. Then number four, the acts or omissions alleged by the complaint and the supporting affidavits do not sufficiently show that the criminal offense or violation of a penal law has been committed. Dismiss. And that the complaint and the supporting affidavits are unsigned or have not been duly subscribed and sworn to as prescribed under the rules of criminal procedure. So these are things that are fatal no, to, the, to, to the complaint. So make sure that you don't violate any of these five guidelines. All right. Uh, next question. Father possessed in bad faith excess land for three years. Now, after which the property was presumably 
presumably <laughs> inherited by M, not the father's son. M was in good faith. For how many years more from the father's death should M possess the land in order to become its owner? No, and what do you think is the answer? All right, the answer is for nine years, since the effects of his possession in good faith uh, should begin only from the dissident's death, because extraordinary prescription requires thirty years and ordinary prescription requires ten years. It follows that th three years possession in bad faith should be equivalent to one year possession in good faith. Hence, applying Article One One Three Eight, one year plus nine years equals ten years. No, but there are uh, there is a latest law regarding this, so please check, uh, take note of the la uh, latest legal provisions. All right. Okay, next question. How many animals prescribed to be owned by those who catch them? No, how again? Again, how many animals prescribed to be owned by those who catch them? Okay, in terms of domesticated or tamed animals. Okay. Wild animals which have become tame and now generally submit to man's control are called domesticated and tame animals. The possessor does not lose possession of them as long as habitually they return to the possessor's premises. Okay, implied the uh, possession of them is lost if the aforementioned habit has ceased. No? But insofar as ownership is concerned, it applies. It says that the owner of the domesticated uh, domesticated animals may claim their them within uh, twenty days to be counted from their occupation by another person. So it will actually uh, prescribe in twenty days. This period having expired without the claim having been made, they shall pertain to be caught and kept. So if your animal is lost for <laughs> twenty days. <laughs> <laughs> it will be considered caught and kept, no, uh, because um, trying to get them back, no, it has already prescribed. Okay, let's proceed to the next. All right, next question. How should we define jurisdiction? Again, how should we define jurisdiction? No, this is for the rules of court. It is the right to act uh, of the power and authority to bear and determine. Uh, a cause, no, a cause of action. It is a question of law. The term imports the power and authority to hear and determine issues of facts of law, and the power to inquire into the facts. No, and also it includes the power to pronounce judgment, and authority to hear and try a particular case, and impose a particular punishment for it. All right, let's proceed. Okay, next question. How many days should you file your motion for reconsideration for the decision of the Secretary of Justice for preliminary investigation? How many days could you file for motion of reconsideration for the decision of the Secretary of Justice for preliminary investigation? Okay, the answer is that the party aggrieved of the secretary uh, by the secretary of justice may file a motion for reconsideration within a non-extendable period of 10 days 10 days lang okay take note 10 days from the receipt of the resolution on appeal again 10 days from the receipt of the resolution on appeal and the uh, reckoning point here is the uh, the receipt of the resolution on appeal okay Next question. What are the other important constitutional norms to be observed uh, in relation to bail? Again, what are the other important constitutional norms to observe in relation to bail? Okay, what do you think is the answer? Okay, you should take note of the following. The right to bail shall not be impaired even when the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus is suspended. Again, the, rate, uh, the right to bail shall not be impaired. Now, that is uh, provided in our constitution that you are, uh, it should not be impaired even with the, with the uh, suspension of the writ of habeas corpus. Excessive bail shall not be required. And take note, obviously, that the requirement for excessive bail can amount to a denial of bail no so make sure that we don't actually do that okay
Okay, next question. To Field World, a POAA license agency, recruited and deployed Mike with its principal Delta uh, construction company in Dubai for two years for a two-year project. After he had worked for a year, Delta and Field World terminated for a known reason their agency agreement. Delta stopped paying Mike's salary. When Mike returned to the Philippines, he sued uh, both Field World and Delta for unpaid salary damages. Isug. May the field world, the agency, be held liable? Okay, the answer to that is yes, since the agency is equally, is equally, is equally, <laughs> is equally liable with the foreign principal despite the termination of their contract between them. Okay, so take note of that, no? The doctrine of imputed knowledge. Okay. All right. Next question: Shasha purchased an airline ticket from Sea Airlines. Uh, let's call it Sal, no? Sea Airlines, covering Manila, Bangkok, Hanoi to Manila, and the ticket was exclusively endorsable to Shaam Airlines or the SMA. The contract of the air transportation was between Shasha and Sal. No, it's between Shasha and Sal. With the le- with the latter endorsing to. SMA or Siam Airlines to Hanoi to Manila segment of the journey. All her flights were confirmed by Sal before she left Manila. Sasha took the flight from Manila to Bangkok on board Sal using the ticket. When she arrived in Bangkok, she went to uh, the Sal ticket counter and confirmed her, her return trip from Hanoi to Manila on board SMA flight number SA88. On the date of her uh, return trip, she checked at SMA flight number no SA888, boarded the plane, and before she could uh, even settle in her own assigned seat, she was offloaded and treated rudely by the crew. She lost her luggage and missed an important business meeting. She thereafter filed a complaint against Sal and argued that it was solidarily liable with SMA for damages she suffered since the latter was only an agent of the former. Should either or both Sal and SMA be held liable for damages that Sasha suffered? Uh, assuming that one is an agent of the other, is the agency coupled uh, with interest? Okay, what do you think is the answer? Okay, Sasha either uh, should either or both Sal and SMA be held liable for damages that Sasha suffered? That's the question. Sal should be liable, no, or the the uh, sea airline should be liable for damages suffered by sasha sea airline sal as the ticket issuing airline is the principal in the contract of carriage so he is the principal and while cm airlines as the endorsed airline is the agent so in this case this is the agent under article 1910 no 1910 the civil code the principal must comply with all the obligations which the agent may have contracted within the scope of his authority the contract of air transportation was between Shasha and Sal, with the latter endorsing to SMA the, uh, the Hanoi to Manila segment of the journey. Such contract of carriage has always been treated in our jurisdiction as a single operation. As the principal in the contract of carriage, Sh- Sh- uh, Sal should be held liable even when the breach of contract had occurred not on its own flight, but on that of SMA. The obligation of the ticket issuing airline remained and did not cease regardless of the fact that another airline had undertaken to carry the passengers to one of their dis- uh, destinations. So the principal will always be the one liable here. Assuming that one agent, uh, one is an agent of the other, is the a- agency coupled with interest? Yes. Where an agency is the mutual benefit of the principal and of the agency, the agency is deemed to be coupled with interest. Now, with an interest, the agent's interest must be in uh, in the subject matter of the power conferred and not merely an interest in the exercise of power, but it entitles him to compensation. SMA, as the agent of Sal and an endorsee airline, has a personal interest in the business. It had assumed a personal obligation for the operation of the airline by undertaking to transport passengers from Hanoi to Manila. Its interest extends to the very subject matter of the transportation of the passengers as an airline a company for it undertakes uh, to transport passengers from one destination to another. Please uh, kindly read the, the case of Sevilla versus Court of Appeals, no? a case decided on June 29, 2005. 
Okay. Next question. Is the waiver of an illegal arrest also a waiver of admissibility of the evidence seized pursuant to the warrantless search and seizure incidental to the arrest? Again, is the waiver of illegal interest also a waiver of the admissibility of the evidence seized pursuant to warrantless search and seizure incident incidental to the arrest? The answer is... Okay, the answer is no. When a person fails to make a timely objection to an illegal arrest, only the right to assail the arrest is waived. He does not have the right to question the admissibility of the evidence seized by the virtue of illegal arrest. The waiver of the illegal a warrantless arrest does not mean a water of the inadmissibility of the evidence seized during illegal warrantless arrest. So, you can only question the arrest, not the admissibility of the evidence. All right. Okay, next question. How do you describe or qualify a possession by force or violence? Or how may it be proven? No? Okay, again. How do you describe or qualify a possession by force or violence? Or how may it be proven? Possession by force or violence or force may be proved express, exp, expressly or by implication. So there are two kinds. Huh? Uh, you can prove it expressly or by implication. The act of entering the premises you know, ex and excluding the lawful possessor therefrom necessarily implies exertion of force over the property. You know, the force may be actual or merely threatened, you know, done by the possessor himself or by his agent, done against the owner or against any possessor, you know, or against the owner's representative as a capitas, you know, done to us a possessor or if occupied during the latter's absence, done to prevent getting back to the premises. Meaning of acts do not affect possession. No, the intruder does not acquire any right to possession. No legal possession. The legal possessor, even if physically ousted, is still the possessor and therefore still entitled to the benefits of prescription. Okay, so take note of that. Okay, next question. Jurisprudence that has the following principle. For parties involved in a chattel mortgage, they could not question the validity of the chattel because they were bound by estoppel. Again, in this jurisprudence, it is the doctrine that the parties involved in a chattel mortgage could not question the validity of the chattel because they are bound by estoppel. What do you think? Okay, the answer is you can read the case of Tomalad versus Vicencio. Okay. Question. What does it mean if bail is a matter of right? Again, what does it mean if the bail is a matter of right? Okay. Okay, if bail is a matter of right, then the court cannot deny bail. He only has the discretion as to the amount of the bail. So you cannot actually, uh, you know, you cannot deny because it's a matter of right. But remember, excessive bail, because you can control the amount, is still a matter uh, uh, a move to deprive the person of bail so it should not be excessive all right let's proceed okay how should a warrantless arrest be affected how should a warrant a, a warrantless arrest be affected okay you should actually do this now you need to inform him with the intention to arrest that's number one then you need to inform the person with the cause of arrest and uh, the, the exception is that when he tries to ex escape or to resist or it will imperil the arrest no? so d don't actually um, you know don't do not imperil yourself by employing uh, an arrest and saying all this inform and then cause then it will cause you to imperil your arrest then that is an exemption no safety first all right okay next question possession of stolen property no so suppose recently stolen property is found in possession of a is a presumed to be the thief no <laughs> okay again suppose recently stolen property is found in possession of a is a presumed to be the thief Okay, the answer is yes. It is a, a undisputable presumption that a person found in possession of a thing taken in the doing of a recent wrongful act 
is the taker and the doer of the whole act. So it is true that the one who possesses a movable uh, property acquired in good faith has what is called an equivalent title, but this is destroyed when it is proved that the said movable belongs to somebody else who has lost it or has been unlawfully deprived of its possession. So careful when you acquire something which was stolen or technically, uh, in the words of the law, you it to uh, the person was unlawfully deprived because you will be assumed to be the one who actually took it from him or you will be presumed to be the thief purpose of article 559 for the purpose of facilitating transaction on movable property which are usually done with special formalities this article establishes not only a mere presumption in favor of the possessor of the chattel but an actual right valid against the true owner except upon proof or loss or illegal deprivation all right okay so we have reached the conclusion for today's episode thank you so much for joining i would like to request if you learned something from uh, our podcast today please don't forget to rate know this uh, podcast and this facebook page so that we can continue uh, helping others Please do not forget to like or heart our videos and share it to your friends. No, you share also this blessing so that um, all our law school friends and also our bar takers will be able to benefit no, from a short and light discussion about the uh, about possible random questions no, in the bar. Okay, thank you so much for joining our episode today. Uh, I, I wish you all the best and I'll see you d- tomorrow for another episode of Random Questions here in Law School Reflections.